Hello and welcome. We are so happy that you're joining us for this session and just delighted to be speaking to folks in New Zealand and Australia. I'm Kathy Stewart. I'm part of the Novelist team. I'm a librarian and I worked in a large public library before joining Novelist. So this feels really comfortable for me. Um, Reader's Advisory was a big part of my librarian life and now I kind of like to think that I do Reader's Advisory from afar by sharing information about Novelist. So today is all about um, doing just that, thinking about and talking about the Reader's Advisory climate in your library. And really it's all about positioning yourself to be able to do that magical thing, to put the right book in a reader's hand at the right time. It's a process though, isn't it? And actually it's a skill set. It gets better if you practice. So we're hoping tonight well, it's tonight for us in the U.S., um, daytime for you. We're hoping to help you by sharing some energy and some ideas from others. So um, getting us kicked off is the first of our panelists, Amy Heap. So let me introduce her. Um, Amy is the Outreach and Promotions Coordinator at Riverina Regional Library in New South Wales. So Amy completed her library degree through Charles Stewart University, and she's been working in public libraries for 13 years. Now she and her team provide programs for people of all ages across 20 branches. Amy really loves helping others find great books to read and then designing and delivering programs that engage the community. So welcome, Amy. Hello. Um, so get us started by telling us a little bit about your library. Um, I, I know that it's located in New South Wales, so we'd love to hear more about it. Yes, yeah, so we have the largest regional library service in New South Wales. As you said, we have 20 branches and they are spread out over 47,000 square kilometres, which Google tells me is about 18,000 square miles in the ancient measurements. Uh, but there are only around 138,000 people across all that area. Our biggest town is Wagga Wagga and that's about halfway between Sydney and Melbourne. Right. And um, if you could just describe a little bit about um, what we call the Reader's Advisory Climate. Um, do all of your staff do Reader's Advisory or are there just a few people designated? Just tell us more about that. Uh, well, some of our branches actually only have one staff member. So mm -hmm. we, we don't have people who are specifically designated to do RA. It's part of everybody's job. And some people are more comfortable with it than others. Uh, some staff members aren't great readers. Uh, some feel awkward making suggestions in genres that they don't read themselves. And I also think that as we run more and more programs, which is a really great thing, uh, we can kind of have less of a focus on core services like Reader's Advisory. Right, right. I think that can be true of a lot of libraries. So um, when you're thinking about um, what you said about some of the staff members not feeling comfortable, um, tell us a little bit about what your library provides just in terms of training. How do you get staff um, feeling a little bit more comfortable? Yeah, well, we run annual training days for all staff across our library service, and we always include Reader's Advisory training in that. So I often use uh, material from the Reader's Advisory Working Group wiki. So for example, we just had these training days, and I used a really great talk from Heather Booth in the US on appeal characteristics. And then I try and include some practical task after that. So we learn how to, to talk about appeal characteristics or use the tools and then we do a practical exercise like I might give the staff a reader profile and then ask them to use the tools to find suggestions uh, for themselves. Oh, that sounds great. Um, and do you do some uh, kind of a um, sort of um, practice with, uh, with staff members answering questions kind of live? Uh, um, kind of a, um, just sort of mock interviews? Yes, yeah, so that sort of thing. And I've also used some of our online RA forms, ones that we've received in the past and handed those out and, and gotten the staff to then use the tools to see what they would come up with to suggest for those readers. 
Oh, that's great. So do you give them the answers first or do you just <laughs> put them right on the spot? <laughs> um, so I don't give them the answers until they're finished. I do show them what we said, like, you know, what I did, but there are no right or wrong answers. There's probably lots and lots of books that fit <laughs> the criteria that people put. Right. And that that's something really I think um, is just an excellent point that you raised just in terms of uh, folks thinking about their own practice is that there is no one right answer. There are lots of right answers, and it's just a question of matching things up. Um, so when you think about what your staff is doing, and you were just talking about a little bit about the training, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about some of the, the resources that your staff finds helpful. Yes. So Novelist is the, the resource that I use most myself and that I point staff and readers to most often. It's great for really quick things like reader likes for their favorite novel, um, but also for more in-depth RA inquiries as well. Uh, I use Fantastic Fiction for series, uh, knowing what order the series goes in and what, what's coming next, but also um, for suggestions based on what their favorite author suggest. So that was a Becky Spratford tip. Um, right. I also use Goodreads. Um, I track all of my own reading on Goodreads, so I use it to remember what I have read. And also I can um, keep things on genre shelves, virtual shelves, so that if I'm being asked about um, young adult fiction, I can go and remember the things that I have read myself in young adult fiction. And also to get reviews from the general public on Goodreads. And then another favorite is the Who Else Writes Like, either in print or online. They're a really great resource that our staff love to use. Oh, that's great. And I, I really love your idea of um, just really tracking what you read. That can really be invaluable when you're really trying to, um, to help that uh, person with the right book at the right time. So yes. great suggestions. Um, so I understand when I first met you, you told me that um, you regularly appear on a radio show. So we would love to hear about that. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you do on the show and a little bit about how it came about. Yeah, I, I started um, going on local ABC radio just occasionally when we had a big event to promote and I just kind of built up a relationship with the announcers and they asked me to come on regularly to talk about books. Uh, I have to come up with the topics myself. Um, I tend to use pop culture a lot, so I might talk about what to read if you're watching whatever is popular on TV at the moment or whatever is on at the movies or even something related to what's on the news. And novelists have that great for fans of section. So, you know, right. for fans of The Handmaid's Tale, you can uh, read these other things. Um, and sometimes I just do pick a genre and talk about, about that. And then other times I just find any excuse to talk about something brilliant that I have read and am passionate about. That so we talk about Jane Eyre cute. a fair bit and um, <laughs> Daniel O'Malley's The Rook and Stiletto. Oh, that, that's really excellent that, they, um, that you get to have so much input into the radio show and the, and the kinds of topics um, that, you, uh, that you cover. So um, while you're on the show, do you get any questions kind of live in real time? Uh, only occasionally. Uh, more often we get people just uh, who ring in quickly to make a comment on something that they also loved or... Uh, I also do um, get people coming into the library afterwards to ask about what I talked about. They can't n remember the title, so they, they pop in and ask, I want whatever it is that Amy was talking about on the radio today. Oh, that's excellent. That's, very, that's great validation of the power of um, making some book suggestions like that. So fantastic. Um, so you referenced earlier um, the Reader's Advisory uh, forms that you use, can you talk a little bit about um, the forms themselves and the resources that you use and just a little bit about what that um, experience is like in kind of um, yes. providing those answers? So we um, put together this form which asks uh, library members 
various questions, what sort of genres they read, um, what types of television shows and movies they watch, the things that they don't like as well as the things that they do, what kind of format they're after, all these types of things. And then uh, we use novelist, fantastic fiction and Goodreads to find suggestions and put together uh, a whole um, sort of PDF with five main suggestions which we describe and then a, a, another list of further authors um, that they might want to try. Um, we don't get inundated with these forms. We, we can tend to get a little bit inundated when we put it in the e-newsletter or uh, on Facebook. So one major tip is only promote it when you are not going to be super busy in the next week or two. Um, <laughs> and we usually give ourselves maximum a week to get uh, the answers back. And sometimes you know, people give very little information. They basically only tell us that they like crime and, and those are in some ways easier to do uh, because we're not using lots of different appeal characteristics. And then other times people have very interesting and specific uh, likes and dislikes and it might take us a little bit longer but it, it's a really great practice for us to to delve into to novelist and fantastic fiction and find them some great suggestions. Oh that's great and then um, just the fact that you were mentioning earlier that you're able to repurpose these into training exercises which is really fabulous too. So, um, yes. So I wanted to take this opportunity to remind attendees that um, if you've got questions for Amy, please do. Feel free to use the chat. Um, just send it to all participants and we'll see the questions and we'll um, get them to her. And I also wanted to let folks know that um, something that we do is uh, we do record the sessions and we also record the chat. There have been some really great book suggestions as folks were joining us. So you can take advantage and um, keep your to-be-read pile really large by um, looking forward to um, selecting and um, identifying the books that have been mentioned in the chat. And while we're talking about chat, if anybody wants to just share um, an experience um, of a question that they used to ask to kind of jumpstart a reader's advisory conversation, just feel free to share. Something Amy just mentioned is a great one. Um, what books don't you like? Um, and tell us why. So if you've got any suggestions for others um, in the session today, um, we'd love to hear them. So, um, so Amy, reflecting on then that, that the work that you're doing, all those things, um, what are some key takeaways that you can share with others about uh, providing um, readers advisory? You said not to <laughs> not to do the to advertise when you're uh, when you're not um, able to staff the, the form online. But are, are there any other takeaways? Yeah, I think the most important thing for me is to empower staff to use the tools available, not to expect to have a whole bunch of titles in your head ready for every RA question. Um, none of us, even those of us who read lots and lots of books, read every genre or every book in every genre. So we all need to use the tools to find the books. And I really love to involve the patron to kind of go on a, a little bit of a quest with them and, and show them novelist as I'm searching it. There are so many fun things in novelist. I mean, the, the subgenres are hilarious and so detailed. Uh, and the appeal mixer, that's a lot of fun. So, you know, kind of don't go in as though you're the expert on every genre, use the tools and involve the patron to find great next books to read. Hey, again, that's really great advice to have fun with it and not worry about knowing every last answer to a question, but using it as kind of a journey. So I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit and talk about another aspect of a reader's advisory. Um, how do you make sure that diverse titles are represented um, in the kinds of a reader's advisory that you do? Yeah, that's one thing we try really hard to do, to include diverse titles in general readers' advisory. So I think it's, it is really great to take advantage of calendar weeks like NADOC week or something and have a display of books by Indigenous authors, for example. But I think it's you know, a bit more important even to make sure that we're thinking about diversity when we suggest any type of books to readers or when we're putting together a display or a reading list. Uh, and we do a book challenge which is library bingo, so we make sure that we include some diversity in the boxes of that challenge as well. Great. And do you have some sources that you turn to, um, both you and um, library staff, um, just to become more familiar with diverse titles? 
Yes. Um, some years ago, there was a, a BBC book challenge, which was a list of 100 not very diverse titles. And Anita Heiss, who is uh, an Australian and Indigenous uh, academic and author came up with her Black Book Challenge, which is 100 books by Indigenous authors, and she's updated it um, twice since. So that's a really great uh, resource for finding great books by Indigenous authors. And then I also use um, Love Ozya. So that's a website that promotes young adult fiction that's Australian, and they have a diversity section. And a couple of years ago, uh, the New South Wales Readers Advisory Seminar was on the theme of diversity. So we had great speakers and there are links to lots of really good resources on the wiki for that seminar. Does sound wonderful. Um, and what about um, if you needed to purchase, making purchasing decisions, are there any um, sources that you'd like to share in terms of um, purchasing titles to help grow um, a more diverse collection? Well, we, we actually outsource our purchasing and I know a lot of libraries do that. So we're currently working on making sure that the profiles we have with the vendors actually include diversity to make sure that they are choosing those titles for us. But also just to make sure to use those resources I mentioned before and, and then use our discretionary budget to make sure that our collections are keeping up with, the, with our communities, make sure everybody is, can find themselves in our collections. But I think too that diverse titles actually um, have a much higher profile these days. So some of this is just going to happen without us even putting great effort into it. So for example, um, the shortlisted titles for the Miles Franklin Award this year were, were diverse and the winner was an Indigenous author, the Too Much Lip, and there are LGBTQIA characters in that novel as well. Right, excellent. So thanks, Amy. You've mentioned some great resources. And just a reminder to um, feel free to post some questions that you have for Amy in chat, and we'll hold those um, till a little bit later in the session. So I want to introduce Jane George, our next panelist. She has also created some great resources. Um, so Jane, you'll note when she begins speaking that she has more of a Midwestern U.S. accent than a New Zealand one. Um, that's because Jane taught Readers Advisory Services classes for MLIS programs at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota, and also at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. And she's presented on readers' advisory and literary programming topics at the American Library Association, the Minnesota Library Association, and Lianza Annual Conferences. And just like Amy, she takes professional and personal pleasure in engaging with readers of all kinds and helping them find materials to their liking. So thank you, Jane, for joining us. And please, um, first, just um, tell us a little bit about your library, which I think is on the Kapiti Coast in New Zealand, I believe, right? That's right, uh, Kathy. And thank you for inviting me. And I'm sorry I don't have a Kiwi accent. I will sound like a foreign-fed <laughs> Midwesterner, so forgive me all. But I have lived here now <laughs> for over 10 years, so I know a little bit about New Zealand. <laughs> um, our libraries are about 50 kilometers from Wellington City. We have a population of about 50,000 here, and we have four branches. The library in the slide is shown is the Paraparaunu Library, which is actually one of our largest libraries. Great. And so just like with Amy, I just hope that you would share a little bit about um, the Reader's Advisory Climate at your library. Um, do all your staff do your Reader's Advisory? Yeah, well, like Amy and, and her librarians there in Australia, all staff do Reader's Advisory, but I have to say that some staff are a little better at it than others. And in some cases, those with the best skills are called on to assist. A recent example was an email we received from overseas from a person who was planning to visit New Zealand. She said she wanted to read books about New Zealand by New Zealand authors that would give her an idea of what New Zealand and New Zealanders were like. And she wanted both fiction and nonfiction. Um, one of our better readers' advisors replied with a suggestive list of authors such as Jenny Patrick, Eleanor Catton, and Patricia Grace. 
Wow, that's oh, interesting. And what a, what a great way to prep for a trip is to really um, immerse yourself in that culture by reading those authors. Um, so tell us a little bit about what your library provides, um, just in terms of readers' advisory training. What does that look like in your library? When we have new librarians at induction, we offer a package of orientation training, which does include readers' advisory. So I focus on the similarities and differences between a reference and readers' advisory interview, kind of following the thinking of Joyce Seritz and Barry Trott. So there is no right answer, and it's a conversation about books. We look at print and online resources, and we talk about ways to keep improving your knowledge for example, the five book challenge, which I might talk about a little later, and expectations regarding ongoing contributions, so updating genre guides, staff picks displays, and a yearly poster that we create um, with staff favorites. And I do that using Library Aware, which is part of our Nautilist um, subscription. Cool, and um, Joyce Serex and Barry Trott are very uh, familiar to those of us at, at Novelist. Uh, we um, are, are very definitely familiar with uh, the Reader's Advisory Guide. So um, we wanted to, to hopefully uh, take advantage and address the five book challenge and um, follow up with you a little bit about that. Um, but I also wanted to turn your attention to those genre guides. I remember when I first met you, that you were telling me a lot about the genre guides that you've put together. So um, tell us a little bit about those guides, how they got started, and um, who puts them together. Well, to be honest with you, I cannot actually tell you how they got started because they've been around forever. But we think that if there was a catalyst, it was probably a customer who asked for them. Um, mm -hmm. What I like about them, I think my, my favorite thing is that we've all had the experience where somebody comes up and asks us for a suggestion or a recommendation and we kind of freeze. So having these guides to actually share with people, take them into the stacks with lists of authors that write in a particular genre and then actually give them the brochure is a really cool thing to do. It helps us and it helps our readers as well. That's great. And so do you um, find that um, staff helps you put those together and do you update them frequently? Kind of what, what does that process look like? Yeah, we do. Um, staff are assigned if nobody volunteers and we generally do have some volunteers so that's always good. We don't have a huge number of staff so it's great to have volunteers and I send out an invitation every year so some staff do the same guide every year, but then when someone leaves or if a staff member wants to try their hand at something new, it is possible to change things. We have one staff member, for example, who does the horror guide and she says she doesn't know a lot about the genre as it isn't something she regularly reads, but she feels that she does learn by doing this. And this year we had a new volunteer for our LGBTQIA brochure and frankly it looks very different from our last version because she energetically searched out new and relevant material. Oh, that's great. So kind of like Amy, sounds like you um, use these for a couple of different purposes, both um, you know, definitely assistance in answering questions, um, something that patrons can take away, and then also um, for training, which is just really fabulous. Um, oh, so tell us, um, we're curious, uh, which one's the most popular? Well, I have to admit that crime is definitely our most popular brochure. It's certainly the one I most often restock, but they are all used fairly regularly. Well, that's, that's good to do. <laughs> it seems like there's always a standout, so it's not too surprising to hear that it's crime. So um, are these, because um, I'm sure folks are curious, are these, um, adult only or do you have some for youth or any plans for that? Well, our youth team here at Cassidy Coast District Libraries have created some other resources which are just a little bit different from these guides, but I do think it's a goal worth considering. We purchase occasionally crossover appeal, book club in a bag titles, for example, and I think a guide that sort of pointed people to these adult teen 
crossover appeal um, titles would actually be very well used by both adults and teens. Right. And I, we wanted to include this slide just showing those um, guides in action, which is just really great. And you did something else, too. Um, Tell us a little bit about the um, New Zealand Author's Guide. You re referenced that a minute ago, um, and I know that readers really gravitate toward particular authors, so tell us a little bit about those guides. Right. Well, we have both the brochures as well as bookmarks, and those also are extremely popular. And again, they did start before my time at Capity, but I think they were in response to readers wanting to have a handy list of New Zealand authors so they didn't have to browse the stacks looking for the books with our New Zealand spine label. And I think we have to agree that sometimes the cataloging isn't necessarily consistent or totally helpful, searching subject headings. So you know, it's really great to have a little handout that you can give people. Right. And again, it's just a nice way to um, think about and um, really be responsive to the things that are getting asked for by your readers and the folks in your community. So that's great. So I'm going to um, switch gears on you, as I did with Amy, and just ask you a little bit about um, diversity. Um, so Amy talked a little bit about their library's efforts toward um, inclusion. And um, you'd mentioned that you have a section in your library with um, Maori culture. So can you talk about um, some of the resources that you have and uh, efforts that you make to make sure that your collection is a diverse one? We do have at each of our libraries a Te Matihiapo and Matahi collection in both the adult and children's areas. And um, the Te Matihiapo that is pictured here in this slide does include nonfiction. So our fiction actually goes with the general collection and it does have a little label, a spine label that identifies it as such. Um, now in terms of ensuring that it is diverse, particularly with relation to Maori um, culture, because I'm not a native New Zealander myself, even though I am now a citizen, hip hip hooray, um, I do <laughs> rely on my colleagues um, who have, they have special knowledge of the culture and we, at, we quite recently, until quite recently, had a Maori and Heritage Coordinator who actually did quite a bit of work in that area. So I mean, we also scan local publishers such as Julia who do Maori and Pacifica material. And we look at Victoria, Auckland, and Otago University presses as well just to make sure that we are picking up that local and diverse material. Oh, that's great. And it's so, I'm sure, extremely helpful to have such a knowledgeable person on staff um, to really help you out. Um, so we'll go back a slide. And I think I remember you're mentioning that your library does some programming that features um, local authors um, and also authors whose work, you know, definitely represents a, a diverse point of view. Yeah, that's right. And we have a really great Friends of the Library group here at Cavity Coast, and they sponsor a lot of book launches and programs, but we pick up a few things, and one of them we just have this year our third annual Nio Marsh Mystery in the Library program. So what happens is there is a coordinator, and he picks people from our area or the lower North Island of New Zealand, they're invited to come for a panel presentation. They take questions, they talk about their work, and they have all been nominated for the Nile Marsh Award. So that's a great program, and we plan to continue with that. Well, that's excellent. So gosh, time has gone by quickly. <laughs> we just sent a reminder in chat. If you have um, questions for our panelists, we're happy to take those. We've got, um, I think, time for a couple questions. Um, while we're waiting on that, uh, first, um, Jane, if you could just describe that five book challenge that you referenced, just tell us a little bit about that and how you use it with training. That would be um, that would be very helpful, I think. Okay, it's it's one that um, I use pretty regularly with induction, and it comes from Joyce Serix's Reader's Guide to Genre Fiction, Reader's Advisory Guide to Genre Fiction. 
and it's in the appendix. And she picked it up from another author. But what you do is each year you select a genre and you read five titles from that genre so that you can get a feeling for what it is people like about the genre. So you might start with science fiction and read Isaac Asimov, Philip K. Dick, somebody like that. And then next year you'll pick up romance and you will read those, read some authors in that area. So it's actually a really useful way to push the boundaries for yourself and make yourself read things that you wouldn't normally read. Oh, that, that's such a good point. I think that all of us um, really benefit from um, just kind of reading out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I think it makes us all um, just feel a lot more confident about tackling questions. So great suggestion. Um, and I have a question for Amy, too. Um, Amy, if you think about your reader's advisory culture as it currently stands, um, do you have any plans in the works to make changes about how you provide reader's advisory? Um, well, one of the things that I would really like to develop for next year is a self-paced online training program, which we could assign staff to do in their own time, or well, not, you know, at home, but when they're off the desk for a little while, just to uh, kind of chip away at this uh, online training program, similar to one that the eSmart Libraries did for cyber safety. I'm hoping to do that, and maybe even to have a version for customers to use just for fun. Ooh, that's great. That's so interesting. Um, we did have a couple of questions. So there was a question about how often, um, Jane, the materials, the printed book lists and bookmarks are updated. That happens annually. That is always the goal. Sometimes we push it out a month or two because we are, of course, really busy like most of you. But annually is our goal. They are updated each year. Great. And then there was another question for either of you. Um, do you add any interesting displays to promote your genres? I know book displays are always um, something everybody's really keen to know more about. So any tips from either of you about um, how you incorporate uh, display creation into your reader's advisory practice? Oh, because I don't work in an actual branch, I don't um, do the displays myself, but recently we've been talking a lot about genrefying our collection and have decided that for a regional library it's way too big a job and so actually doing genre displays and changing them regularly is the way to go. So I think it's a really good way of saying, well, these are all our, I don't know, horror or, or you know, romance or something and, and pulling out titles and even putting diverse ones and ones that you might not expect really do fit into that genre, just to broaden people's horizons a bit. Great. And how about you, Jane? Yeah, we do quite a few displays here. Um, we, For example, with the mystery in the library, we put together a display of crime fiction, which is, as you can imagine, really easy to do. So we selected books, of course, from the authors who were on the panel, but we chose some other popular authors as well and made those available on the night. Um, talking of the diverse um, question, though, during um, Matariki, which is an annual Maori celebration that we have in June, we also put out books on display about Matariki, about the culture, and we do the same thing during Te Reo um, Maori Language Week, which happens every September. So we put books about how to learn the language and. So, you know, there are just so many opportunities for really wonderful displays, and we do do quite a bit of that here at Cafferty Coast District Library. Great. Thank you. Oh, you have both shared some really great suggestions, so thank you both for joining us and just getting us inspired and hopefully providing folks who attended with some really nice um, practical suggestions that they can just put into practice right away. But wait, there's more. Um, we actually have uh, something special for you, an extra. Um, Kylie Peckham is here to join us. Um, both of the panelists mentioned using novelists, um, so we welcome anyone who would like to just stay with us for another 15 minutes of goodness. Um, Kylie would be uh, delighted to, to have you on board. She is um, actually somebody who wears a couple of different hats. 
She's the Senior Customer Engagement Manager at EBSCO, and she's also a librarian at Monash Public Library in Victoria. So she works within the realm of her two passions, electronic resources and all things books. So Kylie, we are just thrilled to have you, and we'll turn it over to you for some training tips and some searching suggestions that attendees can hopefully take away to um, really amp up their reader's advisory game. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I'll just share my screen with you. And a big thank you to Amy and Jane for sharing all of that useful information with all of us today. So for the next 15 minutes, I will provide you with uh, lots of information about Novelist Plus. And what I'll try to do is to tie it in with many of the things that Amy and uh, Jane were both talking about uh, to Cathy today. So the first thing I want to pick up on is that Amy mentioned that Reader's Advisory and Novelist Plus is fun. Involve your patrons uh, when you are looking for reader likes um, and their next best read for them, uh, perhaps using this tool. So there is Lots of things we can do in Novelist Plus. We have 15 minutes today. You could spend hours in here. So I'll begin the session just by talking about the homepage, first of all. It's bright, it's colourful, it's busy. There's lots of things that we can do in here. Uh, the recommended reading lists on the left-hand side of the screen is where I'll begin. Now, I think it was Amy who was talking about some of the reading lists that we have put together. And you can see here that we have our fiction and our non-fiction recommended reading lists. And these lists have been put together by the novelist team. And most of the novelist team are library trained. So you can see, if I jump back to fiction, I have my different audience levels, first of all. So do be aware that you can choose your audience level. And I think Amy was talking about our for fans of reading lists. Uh, you can see the options that we have here. I'm going to jump into for fans of The Handmaid's Tale. And as soon as you select a reading list, the list will open on your screen. And you can scroll down and you'll find your recommended reads presented for you. If you hover over any of the book cover images, you'll have a description of the book. And I can keep scrolling down. And if I click on one of these cover images, it will actually take me to the detail record within Novelist Plus. On the right hand side, you can see that I can easily jump to other reading lists. And when the title that I've selected loads on my page, I have a detailed record for this particular book where I can find out lots of information about this particular title. I can also see things like our appeal terms that we have applied to this title within the Novelist Plus database. And these are all terms that you can search on. And it indicates to me as a reader lots of information about this book. I can see that it is dealing with a complex character, it is a fast-paced novel, and the tone is thought-provoking. If I scroll down, I have four tabs where I can find out things like book reviews. I can take a look to see if this title is perhaps included in some of our lists of articles, or even referenced within a book discussion guide within the Novelist database. But on the right-hand side, what you'll also find is your reader likes. So while I'm looking at this particular title, within Novelist Plus, I have all of my reader likes listed on the right-hand side here. When I hover with my mouse over a reader like, you can see that a pop-up window appears. And in the pop-up window, I have a, de a description of this title. However, I also have a reason for the reading, reader like recommendation. And I guess as a librarian and a book lover, it is often the reason that I'm interested in. So that's something to look out for within Novelist Plus. So just hover. And of course, if you are interested in the title that you're hovering over, once again, you can click 
and you'll be taken to the detailed record and you'll find even more reader likes appearing on the right hand side. So it's really a never, never ending list of reading, reading recommendations within Novelist Plus. Now you can always click on the Novelist Plus logo top left and this will take you back to our home page. Let's have a look at a few other features within Novelist Plus. Our I'm in the mood for books carousels are always quite inviting. You can arrow through the carousel. Note that I do have four tabs here. I can jump through to bittersweet and engaging. And once again, I can also move through to my different audience level. Uh, so Amy was talking about involving the patrons in uh, the search for their next best read. And at the library service I work at, I always get my patrons involved in Novelist Plus. I show them how easy it is to use Novelist Plus and most people are quite comfortable using this particular resource to find their next best read here. So it's fun, it's colourful, it's quite easy to use. And of course, you can always click on a title and it will take you to that detailed record with the reader likes appearing. You can also try our Appeal Mixer. I think Amy just touched on this also. And this is where you can once again choose your audience and you can make your own appeal mix. So you can talk to your patron. Tell me a little bit about the character that you like to read about and you can show them the options that are appearing. And these are all of the appeal terms uh, that are contained in the records in our database and of course they're searchable. So perhaps I like to read about a culturally diverse character. I can also perhaps choose the tone. Uh, let's have a look. Atmospheric. And you can also choose a third appeal mix if you wish to. Now you don't have to, you can just leave it at two and then you can click on find titles. So you're creating your own reading list. You can arrow through the carousel. However, you can also click on view all. Now when you click on view all, all of these titles uh, that you've collated through the appeal mixer will appear in a results list. And you can then use our refine results option on the left hand side. So you can apply some limiters to limit further within this reading list. You could apply a publication date range, fiction, non-fiction, and if I scroll down, you also have additional limiters such as genre, writing style, subject, for example. You can change the sort order at any time when you're working in a results list. I can easily change to date newest and any forthcoming titles will appear at the top of my list here. And once again, if you find an item that you're interested in, you can click. It will take you to the detailed record and you'll find even more reader likes on the right hand side. Now with these reader likes that are appearing on the right hand side, keep in mind it's just the title reader likes we've been looking at at this point. You have a view all option. This is worth mentioning. It will give you a printable list of the likes. You'll find the title, the author, and the reason appearing here. So that's quite useful when you're searching Novelist Plus. So let's jump back to the home page. Something else to show you. Uh, Jane and Amy both touched on uh, the fact that perhaps staff members are not familiar with all genres. We have a couple of things that can help here. And this is useful for patrons and staff members. We have our browse genre option and we also have our keeping up with. Uh, let's have a look at our browse genre first of all. I've jumped into our adult genres. Now you can just use our drop down menu here and you can jump to a genre, but I'll just scroll down just to give you an idea of what we have. The fantasy, historical fiction, horror, mysteries, the genres that you would expect to find in here. And we also have our Australian and New Zealand literature. Keep in mind, you always have your arrows for the carousel 
on the right hand side, but you can also click on our explore option here. Once again, you have your audience uh, level tabs that you can move through. And I can move through lots of carousels that are quite detailed. So New, New Zealand fiction, Australian fiction, non-fiction, and I can work through these carousels. And of course, click on any cover image that's of interest to me. Don't forget that you do have your different audience levels here. So the different ages of your patrons. So that can be of a huge assistance to you as well. Now one area that I really love in Novelist is the keeping up with area. I think working in libraries, we always have a genre that we're not so familiar with. So just arrowing through first of all to show you what we have in here. And of course you can then click. So let's say mystery is not really my favourite genre. I don't read a lot of mystery these days, but it is an area that I want to keep up my basic reader's advisory skills uh, in. So you can come into our Keeping Up With area and you'll find different reading lists. You'll find some awards that you might like to be familiar with. Uh, you can see here we have a reading list for our adult audience on our Nordic Noir. This is very popular uh, these days. And when I click on this link, a reading list will appear. Now while I'm looking through these reading lists, just note that you can actually add any of these titles to your folder. I'm working in a temporary folder today. I can create a reading list. I could create perhaps a book buying list uh, in Novelist Plus as well if it's a collection that I'm wanting to enhance perhaps with some new titles to purchase. Temporary folders can be really useful for creating lists and note that you do have your sign in option. Uh, top right toolbar. You can sign in if you have an EBSCOhost folder or you can create an account or folder and then the items that you store in your folder will be available at a later date. The temporary folders uh, work brilliantly as well here. You can, before you finish your session, you can view your folder and you can perhaps action that list by emailing that list to yourself or to a patron. Clicking back on the Novelist Plus logo, uh, we always have our featured uh, items at the bottom here, our featured audio book. This is Heather Morris's latest um, publication here and we have a featured award winner. But what I'd like to show you before we finish up is some of our options under Quick Links. In here you'll find things like book display ideas, uh, books to movies, genre outlines and our book club resources. So many of our public libraries are managing book clubs these days. If I scroll down, you can see that we have some new and recently updated uh, book discussion guides. Boy Swallows Univer Universe is now available. You can also browse all of our book discussion guides using this link here. Let's jump into Boy Swallows Universe. I haven't yet seen this book discussion discussion guide so it's quite new and you can see here that we have a summary. Sometimes there will be a spoiler alert uh, if, if we feel that we're giving away too much of the plot. So we have a summary and we also have our discussion questions and answers. So these can be really useful for your book clubs within your library service. Information about the author and there is always further reading included at the bottom of every book discussion guide. Here uh, to finish up, note that you can browse by award winners, uh, themes, appeal and genre. And if you want to find out more about searching or browsing by these uh, areas here, you can click over to our help and you'll find information, finding books, by appeal, genre or theme. So we have really detailed help sheets. We have tutorials included in our help sheets here. So please do come back and visit these in your own time. And to finish up our session, let's just run a couple of searches. 
I'm going to run a search on my favourite books, burial rites. When I do so, I'm taken straight to the detailed record. I have information about my favourite book and on the right hand side I have my recommended reads. Once again, the reason is always appealing to me here. I can also run an author search so I can look for some author reader likes. I'm taken to the author record. If I scroll down, I can view the publications by this author. The most recent publication is always at the top of the list and you can work through. Of course, you can click on any of these titles and you will be taken to the detailed record for this particular title. But have a look on the right hand side. My author likes are presented to me. And of course, I can click on view all to print this list or I could click through and it will take me to, in this case, Geraldine Brooks. And I have more author reader likes presented to me on the right hand side. I can also run a search on uh, series or narrator, but take a look at the basic search. It's always also encouraging me to describe a book. What is it that I like to read about? So this is a great way of searching in Novelist Plus as well. To finish up, let's take a quick peek at the advanced search. Uh, Jane was talking about her diverse collections. I'm actually going to leave the search fields blank. However, do keep in mind you could run a search on a uh, theme, uh, perhaps uh, small town horror is one of our themes or genre mystery, but I'm going to leave my form blank. And if I scroll down, take a look at what I can do. I can run a search on an author's nationality. I can also run a search on an author's cultural identity here. I don't have to fill in any other fields. I have lots of fields presented to me, but I can run a search at this point. I'll be taken to a results list and I can then use my refine options on the left hand side once again to refine this list further if I need to. Clicking back on the home page, that's really just provided you with a very quick overview of Novelist Plus. Keep in mind there's lots of things to explore in here. Uh, you can get lost in Novelist Plus. It's good fun and very easy to involve your patrons in. I hope that's been useful for you. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Kylie, and thanks to everyone for attending. We put some information in the chat. Um, we're recording this session and we'll send out a link to the recording in a couple of days. Thank you so much for being here and thanks to our wonderful presenters, Jane George and Amy Heap, and of course, Kylie Peckham.